Welcome everybody, as we have all gathered to study the wonderful word of God. The Bible tells us to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We intend to do that this evening and this morning. Good morning to those of you who tuned in from overseas. We have gathered to study his word and to divide his word accurately. Bow your heads with me and let us ask him to help us. Our Holy Father, we bow before your throne with thanksgiving in our hearts, recognizing that you are the awesome God of the universe and we are your children. We are still, we are still alive, courtesy of your great plan and your matchless grace. And we know that your plan for our lives is still in progress. And that is the only reason why we are still behind. While a good number of people have already been called home. At this moment, we pray that you will open our eyes, that our fellowship this moment will result in our knowledge, greater knowledge of you and deeper appreciation of the work of your son, Jesus Christ. That it will result in the edification of our souls and great blessings to us all. This is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Again, thank you for taking the time to fellowship with other brothers and sisters around the world. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 12 through 15. Hebrews 9, verses 12 through 15, the su superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Jesus' sacrifice was superior because of his perfection. Keep that in mind as we maneuver, as we go through this passage or this section of our study of the book of Hebrews. Jesus' sacrifice was superior because of its perfection. As compared to other sacrifices in the Old Testament. Hebrews 9, verse 12. And not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. If you are one of those who like to mark your Bible, you can mark once for all and eternal redemption. Verse 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the internal spirit offered himself without blemish to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for the reason, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that we are committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance, the promise of the internal inheritance. The superior sacrifice of Jesus, the superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The author now compares sacrifices under the old covenant. He takes the old covenant sacrifices and pair 
pay and pays them with sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the audience. Always keep the audience in mind. They were Jewish believers who, after a while, they started going back to the Old Testament covenant. And they started wondering, why is it that we, they don't practice the animal sacrifices and all those things? And many of them were already were doing this at the time when he wrote them. That's exactly what they were doing in chapter 4, back to Hebrews chapter 4. These people were going back, Hebrews chapter 4, beginning from verse 1, Therefore let us, therefore, uh, I'm sorry, not 4, Rather, number six, Hebrews six. Therefore, one, therefore, leaving the elementary, I'm, I'm, I'm zooming in verse four, but let's begin from verse one. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, elementary teaching, elementary, why is it elementary? They keep going back to the basics, going back, uh, some of them going back to those rituals. And he said to them, leave these things behind. You cannot grow to maturity when you are spending time in the elementary food, in the elementary, not that the elementary or uh, milk, as he calls them when he gets to chapter, in chapter five, he calls them milk. Not that milk is bad in itself. No, milk is not bad. Rather, milk is, milk is bad if that's all you take as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us, let us, which means the author was writing to believers, let us. He included himself among the recipients of this letter. Those who are saved, as many have taught, many Bible, great men of God have taught that this portion of the Bible was written to those who were not saved. And the only reason why they could maintain that position was to back their position because their, one, of their, their position, one of the positions they have taken is that once you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, once you are born again, you cannot fall away. That's the position these people have taken. And when they saw that these people actually do fall away or have fallen away, they said, well, they were not really believers. They came close to becoming believers, but they didn't cross the line of becoming believers. That's what people go through to defend their... I mean, if you see what many Bible teachers, great men, go through to defend their fallacies, it's so appalling. And I don't know why people do so, but they do. We should let the Bible speak for itself and let the word of God comfort as it is presented. And so let us leave, leave the elementary teaching about the Christ. Let us press on. It's a command. Well, you don't give a, an unbeliever a command. <laughs> you give a believer a command. Press on. Let us press on to maturity. Well, again, an unbeliever cannot mature. If this letter was not written to believers, why is the author telling them let's go to maturity? That's another slap on the face of those who have chosen the route to downgrade this spirit-inspired portion of the scripture. Not laying again from not laying again a foundation of repentance. And these people were going back to the rituals. They were going back after somebody has fallen away. And wants to and wants to return back to Christ, they will go, they will take the person back to the ritual to be saved all over again. And the author is saying, leave this behind. Uh, repentance is you, you see the word repentance, repentance from what? From dead works. What kind of dead works? The, the, the dead works that you had before you entered into relationship with Jesus Christ. And of faith, you see, toward God. You see, when it comes to salvation, faith is toward God, toward which, part, which, which God? 
the son or the father? I, I, if you have said the son, you got that right. Faith is always toward faith for salvation is always toward God the Son. Repentance is toward God. That's what Paul says in, in Acts of the Apostles. He said, repentance toward the Father, faith toward Jesus Christ. Why is repentance toward the Father? Because the Father is the one who gives you the invitation. The Father is the one who is calling you to believe in his Son. And so he, tell, he tells them, leave that behind. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Of instructions about washing, washings, plural, different baptisms, they had to go back again. And laying off on hands and the resurrection of the dead and internal judgment. They, they have evangelists come back to preach the gospel back again, back again, so that they will believe again a second time. And this we shall do if God permits in verse 4. This is where I zoom in. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened, enlightened, those who have already been saved and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and powers of the age to come. And then having fallen away, the, the participle here signifies that indeed it is the potential to fall away abounds for Christians. And having fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. You see that repentance is talking about repentance, a brand new repentance. It is impossible to renew a person who has fallen away, giving that person a brand new repentance to start all over to believe in Christ and be saved again. It's, it's not possible. That's what the author is saying here. It's, it's not saying it, it, the author is not saying that the believer who has fallen cannot be restored. No. Nope. When we get to, when we get to chapter twelve, you will see that he believes that the believer who has fallen can be restored. He's not saying that at all. What he's saying is that it is impossible for you, after you have walked away into the world, you have backslided. Let me use the Baptist uh, terminology. You have backslided, and then you come back again to believe a second time. The author is saying it is not possible. It is not possible. You cannot believe second time. You only believe once. Under the old system, under the old covenant, yes, it's possible. Because it's yearly. You do it over and over and over. But under Christ's covenant, it's once and for all. The covenant under his umbrella was done for the internal. That's why I asked you to underline that passage, that uh, word, internal redemption. Internal, everlasting redemption. Which means once you are redeemed under this covenant, you remain redeemed for all eternity. That's good news. That is really good news. And so he tells them, it is impossible to renew them again to a repentance since they again crucified to themselves the son of God and put him to open shame. What is he talking about? So simple. In order to do what you are trying to do to have a second repentance, you need to bring Christ and put him back to open shame and let him be re-crucified re again so that he will produce a new blood for your salvation. And that's an insult to the work of Christ on the cross. And so that's what the author is hammering as we maneuver through this passage, internal redemption. Verse 13, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more with the blood of Christ? How much more? That's a, it, it should, that should sound like, like, a, like a tornado or something, make a, a great noise. How much more with the blood of Christ who through the internal spirit offered himself with that blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant 
in order that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that we are committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance, internal inheritance, the superior sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Again, the author, when I compare the old covenant with the new covenant, under the old covenant, uh, we're going to see uh, the, what does he, what, what is the difference? What does he intend to underscore? Under the old covenant with Jesus' sacrifice, the superiority is of, is, has no equal. And so let's put down some points as we go through these studies. Verses 12 through 14, A, under the old covenant, it is animal blood, goats, and calves. Under the old covenant, it was animal blood, goats, and calves. B, in the new covenant, it is the precious blood of God's son. In the new covenant, it is the precious blood of God's son. C, the blood of goats, and calves, this is important for us to keep in mind. The blood of goats and calves only provided a yearly covering for sins. The blood of goats and calves only provided a yearly covering for sins. D, the blood of Christ provides internal covering for sins. See what he's trying to do here? He's, he's telling them, you are going back, you are going back to this system that was not efficacious, this system that was, was incomplete. Look at the system of Christ. Look at both of them. Under this system, the priest will go to the Holy of Holies yearly to offer blood sacrifice on the ark of God, the mercy seat, as we studied last time. But this covering, there's this covering, the, the, this, the elements, remember the, remember the ark of covenant? There were three elements. All those three elements point to the sins of Israel. When God looked down, he's, he will see the, those sins and he will lambast the Israelites. He will go against them he will punish them. His anger will be so furious against the, camp, the people in the camp. But when that animal blood was put on the top of the mercy seat, God looks down into the ark. He has been covered by that precious sparkling blood of innocent animal. And God is, was satisfied. God was pleased you call it propitiation. God was at those that sacrifice appeased God, and God will no longer deal with the with the sins of Israel for one year, one year, until another one will be done. So it's yearly, yearly sacrifice, yearly sacrifice. But again, the the blood of Christ provides internal covering for sin. His own blood provided internal sacrifice for sin. We, we're going to come to the meat about the modern day water, about holy water. We'll come to that in a moment. But again, let's, let's go back and look at uh, what the author is trying to do here. What is the author, what is he doing in essence? The author is providing uh, amazing truth for all of us and in verse 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place 
once for all, having obtained internal redemption. Let's, let me, let me, let's draw it back and see in the Old Testament. When the whole, when the high priest, only the high priest was allowed to enter into the Holy of Holies. Remember the tabernacle divided with a, a curtain, a veil that covers the Holy of Holies. Nobody could enter into the Holy of Holies, not even other priests, except the high priest. And he does so with blood. He cannot enter into that Holy of Holies without blood. First, the first blood will be for his own atonement. He atones for his own sin. And then he atones for the sins of other people. He atones for the sins of the whole nation. And I, I want you to, to watch the drama here. Uh, this, is, this is, as he studied the word of God, as, as, as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to the truth, it's so good. So, so, so enticing. Pause for a moment. Let's follow me. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go to the uh, envision yourself standing by the tabernacle or watch the high priest go into the Holy of Holies outside the camp. No, as he enters, as he enters into the Holy of Holies. He opens the curtain and he goes in, the curtain closes and covers the Holy of Holies so that nobody stands as a barrier. So that nobody was able to enter or even see if what was in the Holy of Holies. He couldn't see it, why? The curtain was covering it. And he does so. And when he comes out, the same thing happens. He comes, the curtain closes. And nobody can move it. Remember what I told you when the when the when the temple was built, Solomon's temple, that the curtain was 90 feet high, according to Josephus. 90 feet high, 30 feet wide and 18 inches thick. That was the thickness of the curtain, 18 inches, a ruler and a half. Could you imagine? That's how thick a curtain was. So that nothing, the breeze couldn't move it. It was as heavy. The drawn from the top, 90 feet high. Well, but guess what? This is amazing. When Jesus Christ took his own blood, by his own death on the cross, he took his own blood and entered into the most holiest place, the holy in heaven, not the temple, not the one standing in Jerusalem. He went straight to where the pattern was drawn from, into the presence of God. You know what happened? <laughs> Didn't you? The curtain was torn. It has never happened in history. It has never happened in history. When the, under the old system, the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies. He, he would come out, the barrier was still there. Only Jesus Christ's sacrifice was able, able to remove the barrier between God and man. That's incredible. That the barrier keeping us from God has been removed by that one sacrifice of God's son. And now when you read Hebrews 4 verse 16, it makes sense. Let us draw near into the throne room of God. You couldn't do that under the old system. Under the old covenant, you couldn't draw. You can only draw near to the presence of God through 
a priest. You couldn't just walk by yourself and say, I'm going to do it. This, that's, that's not do it myself, kid. It doesn't work at that time. If you go, you will die at the altar. A high priest, it was the responsibility of the high priest to represent the children of God. You name your sins, and he, the high priest will lay his hand on the, whether it's a goat or scapegoat, whatever, and you will name all your sins to the high priest, and your sins will be transferred to that animal sacrifice. Either he was burnt, or he will be let go in the wilderness, carrying away your sins. Not anymore. Jesus Christ has done away with that. His death on the cross was not only caused the curtain to be torn, but also gave us the access, all of us, universal priesthood, universal access to the throne room of God, that you, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, anywhere, anytime, can call on the Father, and he hears you. That's something the death of Christ under the new covenant brought to the church. That's why the church is unique. The church is all about access. It's, Christianity is all about access. You don't need anybody to help you get access to God's throne. You have access. You have been given access. You can enter any time without, without a warning. You don't have to give God a, a, a notice that you want to see him tomorrow. You don't need to see, tell God, uh, uh, when, when can I see you? Jesus Christ is there 24 7, through whom we go to the Father. Through whom we go to the Father. Uh, let, let, me, let, me, let me make a correction there. So that, not a correction that, that what I, what I, I'm not saying that what I said was, was not correct, but the correction in the sense that don't misunderstand me. You don't enter into the throne of God alone. Jesus Christ is your great high priest, is our great high priest, and through him, we enter, through the, we enter to the Father. He's standing there. The same way the Old Testament priest led the people of God to God himself, Jesus Christ, our great, great high priest, now leads us to his Father. And that's why through him we have access to the throne room of the Father. Again, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place, holy place once for all, once for all, not two times as the not many multiple times as the Old Testament did. He entered only once with his own blood, not the blood of animals. Mind you, this is his own blood. He offered his own life. That's the ultimate sacrifice. And that's why the Bible says, greater love had no man than this, than he laid down his life. He entered the holy place once for all, once for all, not two times, having obtained internal redemption, internal, everlasting redemption. It wasn't temporary. It wasn't annually as the old covenant. It was permanent, internal, which means if this salvation has been applied to you, you have internal redemption. That should abolish any thought that you could lose your salvation. That should abolish any thought that once you receive this internal redemption, that it can be taken away from you and then given back to you, yo, yo, yo. There is no yo, yo with the covenant of Jesus Christ. It's once and for all. You can celebrate once you receive this internal pardon. He says to you, you are saying that we remember no more. That's under the new covenant. Does that mean, does, does it mean you have a license to live as to live anyhow you want? Far from it. Far from it. When we, when we get to chapter 12, you better not think that. When we get to Hebrews chapter 12, you will see that God rips apart, rips in pieces those who take this sacrifice for granted. Those who look at what Jesus did on the cross and say, ah, it doesn't matter. Ah, that death doesn't matter. I can live any how I want. My friend, I hope you don't think that way. For the fight that you, for the, the, the day you think that way and act that way or live that way, 
you are preparing yourself for the wrath of God. Here on earth, not in heaven, for there will be no wrath in heaven. Wrath is removed. Once you enter into heaven, wrath is removed. There will be no more wrath, no more pain, no more sorrow. All things have passed away. It's only now that God will deal with us when we take his grace for granted. That's why the Bible wants us. We get there. Don't take the grace of God for granted. Don't take the grace of God. You see, grace is all about the provision for us to serve God. God has given us provision to serve him that we couldn't serve him under the old covenant. That's what grace is all about. Grace is not for us to, grace is not for, to be wasted. Grace is to be used. And so in verse 13, it tells us, for if the blood of goats, this is also important, and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. How much more? How much more? Again, in verse 13, it says, if the blood of goats. Now, go back to chapter 6, where we, I just, where we just read. What the author is saying here, the blood of goats and calves, they can cover the sins of the people of Israel for a year. For a year, not for six months, not for three months, for a year. And of course, this, this is the atonement for the unknown sins. The atonement for the unknown sins. Since the known sins were atoned every day, Whenever a person recognizes his sin in the old covenant, he brings the required, the required sacrifice and the priest would offer that sacrifice and his sin would be forgiven. The atonement, the annual atonement is for the unknown sins, the sins of ignorance. But it covers it for a whole year. In other words, you can commit all kinds of unknown sins it doesn't matter. It's already on, on the insurance policy. It's covered. Every time you commit an unknown sin, it's covered. God will not punish you for that, for those sins. They are covered under that policy of atonement. And so the author is saying here, if, if that's true, with blood of animal, you can kill any animal, kill goats, kill calves. If this God can take this blood as valid, how much more the blood of his son? How much more will it not cover the sins of the entire human race for all eternity? And so what he's saying here is this, the sin for which, you see, there is what you call preservation sin and post-salvation sin. The preservation sin is the sin that will take people to the lake of fire. Christ payment, Christ payment dealt away with us with those sins. And there's only a requirement, one requirement, only one thing that we take an unbeliever to the lake of fire. What's that? You are a good Bible student, unbelief, rejection of Christ. That's what we call unpardonable sin. It cannot be pardoned. Every other sin, Jesus said, He will be pardoning you, He will be forgiving you. I don't care. Uh, let, me, let me be loud and clear. I don't care whatever sin you committed. I don't care. You can start now and commit your sin until you die. Commit the whole sin. Like be, you can beat Hitler. You can commit more sin than Hitler did. It doesn't matter. When you stand before Jesus Christ with the wipe of his pain drawn on his blood, he tells you, forgive him. But not so fast. There's one sin for which you see that place, you enter in it for all eternity into the lake of fire because you rejected me. I came, I left my throne, paid the ultimate sacrifice, used my own blood to purchase your, to purchase your redemption. You rejected that. It is because of that rejection, which is the greatest insult to me, you are entering into the lake of fire. No relationship with God. So quit. Quit, quit. Those of us who preach uh, hellfire, 
sin, uh, murder, uh, adultery, fornication, sin, uh, all these things will bring you to no, it won't. It has been paid for. The only sin is the sin of unbelief. In fact, we don't, many of us don't give good news. Do you know the meaning of gospel? Gospel means good news. Good news means you tell a person that, for example, somebody is owing a lot of money he couldn't pay and he couldn't sleep, sleepless nights, doesn't know how to come up with the money to pay, knowing that at a particular time he will go to jail, he or she will go to jail. And somebody comes along and said, I got good news. Guess what? That debt has been paid. What? The debt has you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. The debt has been paid. Somebody has paid for it. Paid what? Yes. Your debt has been paid in full. You owe nothing. And you're not going to jail. This is good news. He can sleep like a baby. My friend, that's the gospel. Many of us don't give the gospel. We, all we do is scare people. Hell, hell. You, are, you, are, you, are, you, you lie yesterday. Hell coming to you. you. You drinking. Hell coming to you. You smoking. Hell coming to you. That's not good news. Good news is to tell a person that he's in debt and that Jesus has paid for it. And to accept him is eternal life. To receive him is eternal pardon. That is good news. That refreshes the heart of someone with a heavy burden. And that's why Jesus said, come to me with all of you with your heavy load, I will give you rest. That's good news. Come to Jesus. He is the only one who is qualified under the new covenant to give us internal pardon, internal redemption, and to purify us from all sins. And so in verse 13 again, it says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes, this is, pay attention to those ashes of a helper. What's that? Sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh. What's that? Well, the ashes there of a helper was residue, was the, uh, uh, the elements from the sacrifice, the, the burnt offering. They were sprinkled on the lever, washing lever, and prepared in a special way to, to have a ceremonial cleansing for ceremonial cleansing like a holy water like a holy water call it that and it will be sprinkling people who are defiled to keep them cleansed to to purify them to, to cleanse them holy water remember i said that we're going to talk about holy water i think it's time to talk about it now you look at numbers 19 verses 1 through 10 this is where you will see this practice, this the documentation for what I'm just telling you. And they will sprinkle them and keep them clean. But that's a shadow. That's a, that was a shadow. Jesus Christ was, when Jesus Christ came under the new covenant, his once and for all efficacious sacrifice on the cross brought about internal cleansing. And that's why 1 John 1 verse 7 says, the blood of Christ, his son, God's son, cleanses you, continually cleanses you from all sin. You see, the cleansing done with that ceremonial water from the burnt offering is now replaced by the death of Jesus Christ and his sacrificial work on the cross. That through that blood, we now receive continuous cleansing, that the sprinkling from the ashes, burnt offering, remember the burnt offering itself was Jesus Christ, was a type, that burnt offering. Let, let, let me take you back so you can get this whole, this whole picture. The burnt offering was done behind the altar. This is the Holy of Holies. Outside of the Holy of Holies, the burnt offering was done by the altar. The altar is not in the Holy of Holies. This burnt offering is representing the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Guess what? Christ was crucified outside the gate. 
Hebrews 13 verse 12 tells us, he was crucified outside the gate, which portrays the fulfillment of that sacrifice, which was done outside of the Holy of Holies. And he takes his own blood and now goes into the Holy of Holies. The same way a high priest takes the blood from the, from the altar and goes into the Holy of Holies. That's what Jesus did. And by so doing, Jesus has fulfilled that bond, all the sacrifices of the Old Testament has been fulfilled in Christ and has done away with all those shadows like sprinkling of water, holy water, holy water that many churches do today is just useless. So it's, it's, it doesn't fit, it doesn't, it's not in the church. Christ has done that. The sprinkling and cleansing is already done in Christ and his blood. To, to go and bring whole water and call it holy, of course, it's not holy because you're not even doing it as it ought to have been done in the Old Testament. That's why it's a heifer here. It's a residue from the burnt offering and he used to, and sprinkling the liver, water basin. And from there, they prepare special holy water, if you, if you can call it that, that's fine, through which they can sprinkle people, keep them sprinkling on people, cleansing them. But Jesus' death has done that. Let me, let me put it this way. For you, as a believer, to go and grab, take water and say that you are cleansing people, you are cleansing people. Let me tell you what you are doing. In essence, you are saying that the work of Jesus Christ is incomplete. You couldn't be so wrong to say that what Jesus did on the cross, that his blood is not sufficient to cleanse those who have trusted in him for all eternity. That's, that's how we get into sham. Many, many, many have made a fortune selling so-called holy water. Many, and many are still doing it today. Don't be duped by, so, by those people they are, of course, they are all, if they are truly believers, I, I tell you, they have been employed by Jesus Christ. They are Christ's employees. They are not my employees. In fact, I'm an employee myself. But the, 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 the news that I have for everybody is that all of us, whatever money we make, we're going to account when we, when we arrive to the real boss, Jesus Christ himself, the general manager. We're working for him. So if you're making merchandise, selling people water, telling them it's holy water, stay away. For one day, you will arrive and give account for what you did with what Jesus Christ has given you. And so in verse 13 again, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh. See, they cleanse their flesh. How much more? In other words, a different covenant under a different dispensation. How much more would the blood of Jesus Christ, which was offered through the internal spirit, offered without blemish, to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works. Your conscience, see, conscience is a marvelous gift of grace. This conscience, this conscience can be our guide. It can also be our, our worst enemy. The conscience, clear conscience, bad conscience. The Bible talks about conscience. You cannot approach God when your conscience it's not clear. In 4 John 1, chapter 3, it says, if your conscience does not condemn you, but the blood of Christ cleanses us from all this, when we apply, when we fail as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we acknowledge our failure to God. We confess our sins to him. And we receive forgiveness of our sins. And cleansing, our conscience is cleansed when you know that Jesus Christ has forgiven you, there is no need to live 
in guilt. If Jesus Christ has forgiven your sins, the devil would want you to live in guilt. Guilt is a terrible thing. Conscience, clear conscience. That's what the Bible, that's what the blood of Christ does. If you know that, that you have been set free, you need to live as one who has been set free. You've been set free. Don't let the devil preach to you. Don't let the Satan trick you. Wake you up in the middle of the night and, 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 and flash half a dozen sins you committed 10 years ago, last year, even last week, and tell you, you are trapped, you are finished. God can never forgive such sins. Who says who? See, all, all Jesus had to do is to lift his hands before the presence of the Father. And that glowing, glowing hand that was that were pierced by those awful nails. All he has to do is put it in, in front of the father. That's all. And the father realizes or will realize, yes, I don't even want to see that those hands again. <laughs> I don't want to see those hands. It, it reminded me what happened 2,000 years ago. It reminded me the agony, the pain. I just, I, I, just, I wish, I don't know why the father, when he resurrected, he left, he left those scars. <laughs> For me, I think it's just a reminder, internal reminder of what sin meant to the holiness of God. The scars of Jesus will stand as an internal reminder of what, how God viewed sin or how God views sin. Don't think that God views sin lightly. When you want to think that, think of those cars that Jesus still bears and will bear forever. I don't know how a normal Christian, a normal believer, can think of the scars of Christ for all eternity and still view sin as, hey, nothing to it. May God have mercy on us. That's all I can say. And so in verse... Uh, Again, returning back to our passage in verse, it says, serve the living God. In other words, you, are, you cannot serve God when your conscience is, is darkened or damaged. And so the blood of Christ restores your damaged conscience so that you can enter into the throne room of God with great joy. And verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since a date has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant. In other words, what, what he's saying here is that those people under the old covenant, they were looking forward to the new covenant. They were looking forward to the work of Christ. So under retroactive exposition, the work of Christ applied back all the way to Adam and Eve. All the way. See, remember the first animal sacrifice was done in the garden. That first lamb, which was slain in the garden, was a, a pointer of the lamb of God, God's son, Jesus Christ. So the blood of Christ, the work of Christ, covered the entire human race, those who believed in the Son of God, looking forward that one day he will come to fulfill the promise that God has made to man. He will come. Uh, Adam and Eve were looking forward. They believed the message given to them in Genesis 3.15. That's why they called their son God's seed. That's the meaning of, of uh, Cain, God's seed, thinking that that was a fulfillment. No, it wasn't. But at least they, they expressed that they believed the message given them. Salvation is only by faith alone, in Christ alone, in Yahweh alone. It was Yahweh that gave them the message, Jehovah God. And so they believed. And it was credited to them for righteousness. And what did God do? He killed the first lamb. 
and he used the skin, as Isaiah says in Isaiah 61 verse 10, it becomes clothing of righteousness. He clothed them with God's righteousness. Unless you receive God's righteousness, you cannot be with God forever. And his righteousness is obtained not by your works, not by, not by being good, not by joining the church, not by baptism. God's righteousness is obtained only through faith in Yahweh God or Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 22. The righteousness of God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Even Paul himself said in Philippians 3, verse 9. Not, I am struggling not that I will enter into God's kingdom with my own righteousness, which is insufficient, but by the righteousness of God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So salvation comes only through one way, not by keeping the law, for nobody can be ever saved by keeping the law. Galatians 2 verse, verse 16, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. So are you trying, if, if you find anybody who is trying, struggling, trying to please God by keeping this law, keeping that law, tell the person to stop that burden. The burden has been removed, carried by Jesus on the cross, cried for three hours. It's now a simple matter, faith in him and in him alone. And so let's get take this three points of truth. One, as we close, to set us free, point of truth, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. One, Christ's sacrifice is sufficient. One, to set us free from internal damnation once and for all. That should give you peace. <laughs> Do you know? You know what the Bible says, don't you? Romans 5, 1. Romans 5, 1. Turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Do you experience? Sometimes we read the Bible, but we don't, we don't experience the Bible itself. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, faith alone, we have peace. Peace. Arena. Peace. Undisturbed. Tranquility of the soul. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace when you think about your salvation? Or are you still struggling? Whether you lose it tonight and get it back tomorrow, or whether you have lost it and will never get it back. Are you still struggling? That's not peace. But justification brings peace. The reason why you don't have peace is because you have not mastered the truth that, has, that is associated with your redemption. And so it says, to set us free from eternal damnation once and for all, Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation. No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you see in, your, in King James Version, you see to those who walk after the Spirit. That's not part of the original text. It was added by those who translated King James Version. It was not part of the original. The original says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, period. Any other thing is to make people, to scare people, or to try to help God. Two, sufficient to restore our damaged conscience. That's very important. To restore our damaged conscience. Finally, to cover our sins for all eternity. See, our sins have been covered. You know why it's covered? <laughs> Look at verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28, our text. Look at verse 28. It says that Christ is coming in verse 27. Verse 28 says, so Christ also, having been offered once for, wants to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin for those who eagerly await him. In other words, when he returns back again, he's not going to bring you the list of the sins he committed here on earth. They have been dealt with on the cross. And having said this, having said this, this is principle. Put this principle down. As believers, sin cannot get, up, get us in trouble in eternal state. Listen carefully. 
as believers, sin cannot get us in trouble in the internal state. Sin. You hear me? Do you hear me very cl clearly? Sin cannot get you in trouble in the internal state. Why? I just read to you Hebrews 9, 28. He said that Jesus will return. He won't mention sin anymore. Why? His hands. You see his hands? You see those pierced nail. That's what the sins. That's the payment for sins for all eternity. So why would he, having paid something and then comes back to talk about it again? See, see it's an old debt paid in full. So he won't mention it again. So you can go start now to sin, my friend. What kind of sin do you want? Take a brand, start sinning. When Christ returns, he will not mention it. But that, let me give it, I just, what I just told you now, let me give it a, there's a warning level. There's a level of what I just told you. There's a warning level. Read the warning level. The warning level says it so clearly. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That's the warning level. That money level is saying, don't take the grace of God for granted. If you want to sin, go ahead and sin. It will not, it will not stop you from going to heaven. Because in the first place, you are not saved because you stop sinning. You are saved because the grace of God by grace, not by you. That's why it tells you in Ephesians 2, by 8 and 9, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith. Faith alone, that not of yourselves. In other words, salvation is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is a gift. You don't work for a gift. A gift is not given to you because you are good. If something given to you because you are good is a reward, not a gift. It is a gift of God, none of works. This any man should boast. Sin does not get you in trouble in the internal state. Sin gets you in trouble in time. God is holy. That's why he says in 1 Peter, be holy just as I am holy, be holy also. God is holy. It doesn't associate with sin. That's why when we sin, we break fellowship with God. When we sin, we break fellowship with God. God doesn't tolerate sin. Sin in the lives of believers cut, cuts them out from fellowship. That's what sin does. And when you're when you not in fellowship, you lose Tremendous blessings that come from fellowship. One of the things you lose, you lose the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You lose peace. You lose joy. You lose all the things that the Holy Spirit will bring in your life. See, the, one of the reasons why people are so dis, distressed, so depressed when things fall apart, you know why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit controlling them. If you have the Holy Spirit controlling you, he produce peace which passes all human understanding, whereby you can, you can be at ease. You can relax even when things fall apart and people will be looking at you and they wonder, wow, what's going on in your life? That's the peace of God. You, you, you're not going to be, you will not even be living such a life that uh, you wouldn't know because you're not, you're, not, you're not practicing something. See, Christian life is not something you are practicing. Okay, today I'm going to. I'm not going to be angry. Today, today my my goal is not to be angry, really. And somebody cuts in front of you in the road on the road, you say, mm. I say I won't be angry. He cuts out again. He said, I told myself I will not be angry. He don't tell you, you snap. <laughs> That's human, isn't it? Or you are at work. You say I'm not going to be angry at my co-workers. And they say something, you say, no, nope. I said, I'm gonna be angry. I'm not gonna be angry, no. Until somebody crosses you where you really snap. That's human, isn't it? That's not Christian life. Christian life is lived by the Holy Spirit through you. He enables you, he empowers you to live a life that ordinary human being couldn't live. And when you are doing so, you will enjoy the tremendous blessings that come from being God's child. God has given us tremendous blessings. Why would anyone don't want to experience this blessing God has given us? 
you can live a life. Things can break apart in your life. I remember, I don't like a, when I when we first when we had our first baby, our first daughter. She only stayed for 24 hours. God took her home. 24 hours. And by the way, her name is Grace. So when you go to heaven, look for Grace. <laughs> look, oh, you say Grace, are you Moses' daughter? Yeah. 24 hours, God took her home. The police, the detectors, the, the, those people who try to detect the detectives or whatever they do, they just come, they came there uh, to see whether we had anything to do with the death of the baby. God gave, God took away. My wife and I, we sat there with their big notes. They wrote back and forth, back and forth. They asked questions, looking at us. We didn't know what they were doing. We just living our life. Three weeks later, the report came out. One of the, the, the first thing they wrote on the, first, on the page of that, of that report was they were calm, peaceful. Why wouldn't we? Knowing that God is in control, God determines. We are just here to fulfill his plan. We, were in, we didn't know that's what they were trying. We just, they were looked at us and they said, we are, they were calm, relaxed, peaceful. That should be the mark of a believer who knows that God is in control, that circumstances are not in control. That should be your mark as a believer that people can see. You don't pretend to be what you are not. But if you are living the life that honors God, those around you, it will draw them to ask, what's in you? What's the difference? What makes you your life different. I want to read what, in terms of worship, because you have been redeemed to worship. I want to close with Spurgeon's statement, one of the great preachers of the old, quote, and dear friends, do keep in mind that you are henceforth to serve the living God. You, you that are acquainted with the Greek we find that the kind of service here mentioned is not that which the slave or servant renders to his master, but a worshipful, a worship, worship, worshipful service, such as priests render unto God. We that have been purged by Christ are to render to God the worship of a royal priesthood. It is ours to present prayers thanksgivings and sacrifice. It is ours to offer the incense of intercession. It is ours to light the lamp of testimony and furnish the table of show bread. Father God, thank you so much for your mercies. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the unparalleled um, sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ on the cross. Thank you, for you have demonstrated that you love us so much. As the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world and he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And it tells us in Romans 5, 8, this is truly love. While we are yet sinners, Christ died as a substitute for us. We have done it all. All we owe you is worship. Worship through worship with our lips, through worship with our minds, with clear conscience. Thank you so much, Father, for you for building us as you said you would in, in Romans chapter 8. You said that you are building us, you are making us to be like your son Jesus Christ. And so, Father, for those people who have tuned in, and they particularly those my friends my brothers and sisters from overseas who tuned in, who forgot their sleep. <laughs> in fact, right now, especially in Nigeria, where the time is six hours difference, right now is 2 a.m. And while many of us in America at 2 a.m., that's when we're getting our deep sleep. People have forgotten, forgotten their sleep just to hear your word. 
I ask that you extend special blessing to those people. Thank you for those who also forgo their, uh, whatever the activity they, they have this evening, they put it aside to fellowship in the teaching of your word. Enrich their souls, bless them equally. Thank you for all that, all that you do. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you for we know you have a plan for all mankind. Concerning this virus, we know you have a hand on it as you have your handwriting on the wall. We pray that you will revive this, you revive the church. You revive us as a church, that we will quit dangling around, that we will quit playing game with you, that we come forth and worship you as you ought to be worshiped. Challenge us each day. Challenge us as we grow in your grace. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Keep us yearning for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep us loving you. Keep us loving one another. Pray for our nations. Let you be merciful. Just remember mercy. Many people have, they, people have died under this coronavirus. It has displaced many things. Remember mercy. Remember mercy, Father, and restore the nations and open the doors for massive evangelism. We who are here are so eager to jump into the wagon of evangelism overseas. And there are restrictions in many countries where you can't even come in. Remove this, that your evangelism may spread like a wildfire. Thank you again. Keep us humble. Keep our hearts burning for your kingdom. Until we meet again, we lift our prayer in other name than the name that you gave to us, the name that I have spoken about, the name that we refer, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.